It's so fun on Sunday mornings. I've been able to do this a few times, and I always like to see who actually can roll out of bed after last night and get here. And I feel like, like you guys are the hardcore right here in this room. You are the committed journalists. Um, so my name is Carrie Lozano. I have a long relationship with the investigative reporting program. I was a fellow there in 2008, and um, I'm also a graduate of the school. I'm a documentary filmmaker by trade, and I've, I've been telling people that I'm a recently both accidental and recovering television executive. <laughs> um, so I'm, this morning, uh, when Janice asked me to do this, I was really excited because actually, the work and the journalism that we're gonna talk about today really reflects a lot of what I've been able to do, which is to combine both journalism and art in various ways. And in that way, you have a lot of flexibility in your storytelling, but you can also reach other kinds of people. Um, so what we're gonna do this morning, just to set it up a tiny bit, it's a little different from a panel. Really what we're going to do is present successively. And so what that means is you're gonna to have to bear with us with the technical aspects of this, um, because we will be switching computers and doing some audio and things like that. We'll try to be graceful about it, but please bear with us. Um, so I'm just gonna go ahead and start and get us going because you are in for really such a treat right now. Um, beside me is, and I have to tell you, I'm terrified to mispronounce your last name. I should be able to do it, but Daniel Alarcón is here. <laughs> he is, uh, I'm gonna give brief bios. He's a, a great journalist, he's a novelist and he's uh, the executive producer and co-founder of Radio Ambulante, and um, he's gonna tell us his story this morning. Danielle. Hi everybody, thank you, Carrie. <clears throat> um, it's, it's really an honor to be here. I'm gonna jump right into it, um, because Carrie and I are gonna chat afterwards. Uh, this is a, a, from a much longer, it's an excerpt of a much longer piece um, that we produced at Radio Ambulante called uh, The Contestant, La Concursante. Um, uh, so the, the, I'm going to do about 10, 12 minutes of it. The whole piece is about 45, 50 minutes. Okay. So this story begins in uh, July 2012 with the Peruvian premiere of a game show. By that time, it had been seen in almost 100 countries, and in Peru, it was called El Valor de la Verdad, the value of the truth. This is the opening sequence. Buenas noches. 21 preguntas separan hoy a un peruano de ganar 50 mil soles en efectivo. Solamente tiene que responder con la verdad, toda la verdad y nada más que la verdad. ¿Quedará alguna persona honesta en el Perú? Es el momento de conocer el valor de la verdad. If you're Peruvian, you know this host. His name is Beto Ortiz, but everyone knows him as Beto, just Beto. When he took the job as the host of El Valor de la Verdad, he was already considered the most powerful journalist in the country. One time I asked him what it was like uh, being famous, and he was like, that's like asking me what it's like being fat. I don't remember what it's like being skinny. <laughs> so he's been really well known for a very, very long time. And uh, he was offered this job, which is outside of his purview of news, and he liked the format immediately. Me pareció que era, era una fórmula muy astuta para conseguir lo que normalmente a los periodistas nos cuesta muchísimo conseguir, que nos digan un poco más de verdad de lo usual, ¿no? So this is how the show works. Before the taping, each of the contestants is subjected to a polygraph or lie detector test. They're asked a bunch of uncomfortable questions, maybe 50 or 60, a lot of them really uncomfortable. Then on the show, they face some of those same questions again. Their answers are compared to the results of the test, and as long as they keep telling the truth, they keep winning money. And if they get through 21 questions, they win 50,000 soles, almost $20,000. If they lie at any point, or rather if the polygraph says they lie, they lose it all. And they don't know which of the uncomfortable questions they'll face. This was the show's very first contestant. Ruth Thalia Saya Sanchez, operadora de call center, 19 años. Vive con sus padres, in Huachipa, Lima. Um, if you aren't from Lima, let me set the scene. This is Huachipa. Uh, it's an area that's sort of rural, sort of urban on the outskirts of the Peruvian capital. It's bordered by the central highway, which takes you out of the city and into the mountains. There are dusty, unpaved streets, small farm plots, and half-built houses all over the neighborhood. At any hour of the day or night, you can hear motor taxis coming and going. 
This is the neighborhood where Rutalia lived with her parents, her sister Eva, and her younger brother, who was only eight. To her family, Rutalia was funny, charismatic, intelligent. When Beto met her on the set of the show, however, his first impression was a little different. La verdad es que una chica muy promedio, ¿no? Una chica que era era atractiva, pero pero no era una no era una persona que que llamara mucho la atención. Una chica más bien perfil bajo, apocada. But when the cameras came on, something changed. It was as if she lit up. Rutalia, according to the rules of the game, could bring three guests. She chose her parents and her boyfriend. This is her mother. Uh, mi nombre es uh, Vilma Rosario Sánchez Rojas. Huancabelicana. Tengo 42 años. A Lima vine por el futuro de mis hijas. Huancabelica, the province where Vilma was born, is about 14 hours overland from Lima. The family moved to Lima when Rutalia was very small. Vilma and her husband, Leoncio, have a band that performs traditional Andean music. She sings and he plays the harp. They also own a glass shop. The day of the taping, Vilma went with her daughter to the station. Rutalia hadn't told her mom much about the show. The questions, as far as Vilma knew, would be about their arrival in the capital, where they came from, that sort of thing. Y entonces yo le dije, ay, pero con esas preguntas van a ganar plata. Le digo, sí, mami, van a ganar plata con eso. Y entonces yo, yo le dije, entonces yo le voy a decir toda la verdad. How they survived those first difficult days in Lima, selling fruit in the market. It's a common story, but that doesn't make it any less heroic. When I talked to Vilma, I asked her if she was happy that day of the taping. She told me she was. Feliz yo me fui, voy a decir todo con ese orgullo como provinciana. Soy huancabelicana con mucho orgullo, señor Beto. They put her, they put on makeup, uh, they gave her a microphone, and they put her on the stage next to her daughter. Sí, desde el momento que mi hija, como se llama, que iba a ir al programa, yo estaba destrozado. This is Leoncio Sayas, Rutilia's father. He also went to the taping that afternoon, but he wasn't quite as excited as his wife. Yo dije a ella también no vais, dije no vais. Mi esposo me dijo que tú, que cualquier cosa no quieres apoyar. De repente yo decía, o le, si lo privo esto, de repente le va, le voy a truncar en su camino, eso. Ya bueno, pues dije, está bien. On the set, his anxiety was palpable. What are you worried about, Beto asked him. The things I might learn about my daughter, he said. The third guest that afternoon was a young man named Brian. This is how Beto remembers him. Era casi un niño, ¿no? Era un chiquillo, un chiquillo muy joven. Este, un mototaxista. El típico chico de barrio que se recursea, que sobrevive, que tiene su enamoradita, que se va a jugar el fin de semana, o sea... Brian was a serious kid, not very talkative, but handsome. You could tell immediately that he was uncomfortable. Era un muchacho callado y no te miraba a la cara, medio hablaba agachado y... No sé por qué, discúlpenme, joven, yo le odiaba a ese chico. At the time of the taping, Brian was renting a room just a few minutes walk from Ruth Dalia's house. He'd never had it easy. He'd stuttered, his mother told me, ever since an old boyfriend of hers had pushed him down the stairs when the boy was only eight. They lived, like most everyone in Huachipa, hand to mouth. This is the first time we see Brian on the show. Y finalmente, enamorado. ¿Tú eres Brian, enamorado? Brian Romero Leiva. Brian Romero, un aplauso para Brian. Muchas gracias por haber aceptado venir y acompañar a Ruth Talía en este desafío que ella ha decidido tomar. ¿Cómo estás tú? Veo que tu, tu pierna derecha se mueve incesantemente, ajena a tu voluntad. ¿Nervioso? Sí, preocupada. Se me ha sacado la vuelta, ¿no? Eso es todo lo que te preocupa. Lo demás no importa, ¿no? Ok. Bueno, relájense. Recién estamos comenzando. No se olviden que esto es un juego. Vamos a tomarlo con calma. Entonces... The first questions were simple. Even funny, that's part of the structure of the show, of course. Beto asked Ruth Talia if she'd ever skipped class without permission, if she believed it was more important to be pretty or to be a good person, if she'd ever gone a long spell without showering. Laughing, Ruth Talia copped to these minor transgressions, and with each question, she won a little money, and everyone was happy. That afternoon of the taping, the guy backstage communicating with Beto over the headset was this guy. Yo soy Luis David Novoa Jiménez. <laughs> Que tengo que decir lo que hago, toda esa nota. 
At the time, David was working as a producer on El Valor de la Verdad. He'd done the preliminary interview with Rutalia and Huachipa and knew, perhaps better than anyone, what was in store for Brian and Rutalia's parents. Pero como yo no tomaba directamente la decisión, yo era un, un obrero ahí, ¿no? Yo no presiono el gatillo directamente, ¿no? Donde entra esta gente. Eso iba a ser una sorpresa y quizás un momento incómodo y una vergüenza para ellos. I asked him what his first impressions of Rutalia were. She was lying, he told me, and he knew it right away. She had secrets. It was obvious. The day of the taping, David's job was to make sure those secrets got out. Unpleasant, uncomfortable details. Cuando te ves al espejo, ¿qué ves? ¿Ves una chinita? ¿Ves una cholita? ¿Ves una mestiza? Bueno, me veo un poco... No, un poco oscurita, ¿no? Este, un oscurita. Poco, o sea, yo me, me digo siempre, ¿no? Soy un poco oscurita. Es la forma que digo que estoy, como decirlo, morena, ¿no? ¿Te gustaría, ¿Te gustaría ser de piel más clara? Sí, me gustaría ser una ¿Te piel... gustaría ser blanca? Sí. <laughs> ok. There's a lot to unpack in this clip, a lot about race and class in Peru, lines that can seem immutable if you come from a place like Huachipa. This was just one of many uncomfortable moments in the first half of the show. In another, Beto asked Rutalia about her relationship with Brian. She made fun of him and the audience laughed. ¿Te parece Brian un chico guapo? Brian, sí. ¿Es Brian un chico inteligente? Más o menos. Immediately after this moment, with question number 12, Rutali revealed she was only with Brian until someone better came along. Brian looked stunned. When I spoke to David Novoa, he compared Brian to a zombie. But this was hardly all. In a matter of minutes, Rutali revealed that she was embarrassed by her parents' manners, that she had taken the morning after pill on three occasions, that she had sexual fantasies about women. With the 17th question, Rutali admitted she didn't really work at a call center as her parents believed. The truth was that she danced at a nightclub. Brian was devastated. He begged her not to go on. But Rutalia ignored him. With the 18th question, she had the opportunity to win 15,000 soles, around $5,000. ¿Alguna vez has aceptado dinero a cambio de tener relaciones sexuales? Sí. La respuesta es... Verdad. Dos veces, solo dos veces, y de ahí no ha vuelto a pasar ni volverá a pasar. Creo que fue por eh, cuestiones económicas, o sea, que estábamos en una situación económica muy, muy crítica. Beto asked Rutalia if she wanted to quit or stay on and try for the 50,000 soles. Rutalia thought a while, but before answering, she turned to her parents. She begged their forgiveness, and then she withdrew. Thank you. Okay, so this is a 45-minute piece. Yes. And when we did our run-through, the first thing I said is, what happens? So you have to tell us. Well, uh, I should back up and say I was a fellow here at the, at the investigative reporting program. And, uh, and when I was a fellow, I, I told Lowell I wanted to, to investigate drug trafficking and stuff. Uh, but then my wife got pregnant, and I didn't want to go to a dangerous place. Um, so I was like, oh, I'll go to Lima, and I'll go visit this show. Because they had just done a big piece on... Um, on a, they, they'd had a, a veteran of some of the drug wars on the show as a contestant. And I'd been hearing about the show on, on Twitter, you know, Peruvians, were, every sun, Saturday night were tweeting about this show, and I was like, oh, okay, what is that? Uh, and I called up Beto, and I was like, hey, I want to come see the show. And I went to the show, and while I was there, Rutalia had, had been the first contestant, so we're talking about, I went in like October. This, this show came out in July. Um, she disappeared and she went missing, um, and so she had been huge news when the show debuted, number one in the ratings, um, you know, uh, taking over one of the, the, like, overtaking one of the most famous Peruvian uh, TV stars, Gisela Valcarcel, beating her in her time slot. She was in the papers, on the, then, she, you know, months passed, she disappears, and she's on the front of the papers again, um, and eventually they found her body um, at the end, edge of town, and, um, and then the, the whole issue was, who's responsible? Is it her murderer, Brian, um, or is it Beto, 
or is it both, you know? And um, uh, I happened to be embedded at the program when her body was found, when the family came to, you know, ask Beto for money and for help, when, uh, you know, the minister, this was like at ministerial level it was being discussed, you know, like the, the minister's on the phone with Beto and I'm in the room with Eva, uh, the sister. Um, so I had this incredible access and it was just completely fortunate. Um, and it was also like disgusting, you know, it was just a really disturbing vision of the power of media and the way it just grinds up the poor um, and how, you know, in Peru and in many countries like Peru, if you, are, if you come from a place like Huachipa, unless something horrible happens to you, no one's ever gonna pay attention to you. Um, I, I let it alone for like six months because I was so disturbed by it. Uh, in fact, I was so disturbed I ended up going to those, all those dangerous places I promised my wife I wasn't gonna go. Um, <laughs> and then six months later, I was talking to some friends in Lima and I was like, hey, did anyone ever write a next, like a long piece about what that case meant, you know? And no, no one had. And so, um, so I went back, I found the family, they told me their story, and then I tried to do this kind of polyphonic thing of telling the story from beginning to end and, and sort of what it means. Um, and I think it, was, it, was, it came out pretty well. So this story is also in print in California Magazine, which is fairly new, and on Radio Ambulante. Yeah. And now, a couple of times, you've done it as a live, uh, yeah. multidisciplinary piece. So talk about this form and why you were inspired to do that, and maybe talk about the kind of zeitgeist of this live storytelling as well. Right, so it's in California Sunday Magazine, uh, asked me to do a print version, and it ran in their, in their debut issue. Um, I thought that the, the long form written piece um, was good, but what it was missing was the intimacy that you get from hearing Vilma's voice, or uh, being able to see the actual clips of the, of the, of the, the show itself, and how manipulative it is. I mean, you, you know, I don't have to tell you much about Beto. I think you can tell a lot about Beto just by seeing him on screen. Um, and uh, and I, I wanted somehow to fuse those two things and give English-speaking audiences uh, who don't listen to Radio Ambulante the opportunity to, to experience some of the power of, of hearing a woman like Vilma tell her story. In the second half of the piece, this is a very, very abridged version, obviously. In the second half of the piece, we do spend a lot more time with Vilma, with Leoncio, because what happens is once uh, the first few days that she's missing, they go around because they're, 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 they're poor and they have no access, and they're like, hey, our daughter's missing, hey, our daughter's missing, and the only place they can think to go are TV stations because the, the, the institutions in Peru don't work. The, the police, doesn't, they don't pay attention to you. They're like, oh, yeah, you know, fill out this form, and then nothing happens. They go to all the TV stations, and they neglect to say the only thing that they have in their favor, which is our daughter's already famous. Our daughter's been on TV when they finally say, nuestra hija la chica del valor de la verdad, when they finally say, our daughter is the girl from el valor de la verdad, then they are thrust into this meat grinder where they're essentially kidnapped by Channel 9. Uh, literally, like, Channel 9 moves into their house, stalks them wherever they go, and, they, and they're in this position where they're so, you know, they live in such a precarious economic situation that they, they really can't afford to go in taxis from the ministry to the morgue, to this hospital, to that hospital. So they're stuck with the media who's gonna, well, well, we'll drive you around everywhere you need to go on the condition that we film everything and we just, you know, just destroy your life again. Right. Okay, we're going to open it up to questions. And I think there's one mic rolling around. So there's one back here. Great. Oh, there's two mics. Hi, David Evans with Bloomberg. I'm curious, she was on the original game show and you said she continued on TV for some period after that. Yes. How did that, can you explain how that manifested Well, itself? I mean, the, the kind of publicity, uh, the mechanics of the publicity of the show is, uh, the show is released on a Saturday. On Monday, you go on Beto's show and you do like a post-game interview. Uh, but then she was on the cover of a bunch of newspapers and then a bunch of follow-up because the revelations were such that, um, uh, you know, Brian became a character, uh, you know, the jilted, you know, uh, you know, lover uh, who didn't know, and um, you know, there was a lot. There's a lot of machismo in Peru, and they wanted to get his side of the story, and so there was news magazine pieces and that and this, and there was a, just a ton of follow-up. And you and you mentioned that there was a series of a panel of questions, 50 or 60 questions, that they answered beforehand. But then you said there was also a lie detector test. I was a little confused. Yeah, if they knew what the answers were, they'd know automatically if she was lying from the, the answers before the show. 
right. the purpose uh, of the lie detector? I'm so, 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 the, w w yeah, it's a little bit confusing. The, the, the show is this. You go, you're asked, they, first they ask you all, they hook you up to the lie detector, right? Um, let me back up. First, a producer goes and does like a download interview with you, right? Then he writes a report. He and Beto make up a questionnaire, 60 questions, say. They bring you in. They, they hook you up a lie detector test, and they ask you all the questions, right? And then um, they record all the answers. And then when you're on the show, they, they, they know which questions you've lied and which questions you haven't, you've told the truth, right? So then they ask you the questions again. But you can see on the show, she's not hooked up to a lie detector there. They've already done the lie detector test previously, right? Um, so they're relying on their interpretation of the lie detector. So there's no way of knowing. They made the lie detector, obviously, is fallible. So they may even be accusing her of telling an untruth when it's simply a, a lie detector determination. Yeah, I think what, what David Novoa meant is, of course, lie detectors are complete nonsense, right? So uh, that's one of the ways that it's a very manipulative show. Um, what David Novoa meant that she was lying, I should have clarified this, lying to her family. You know, she had a lot of secrets, you know? Um, and he, he sort of knew, knew that. She, uh, you know, yeah, could have been lying to the lie detector test because we obviously, you know, it's not science. That's, that's you know, whatever it is. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit confusing. And I think in the longer version, it's a little clearer. So I apologize if it it's wasn't. It's worth saying that the show is, you know, it doesn't exist anymore, correct? In Peru, it was canceled after two seasons, yeah. yeah. But it wasn't canceled after this, this murder. Was this the only show where there was some bizarre, horrible... No, uh, in Colombia, a woman went totally kamikaze and admitted that she had hired uh, hitmen to kill her husband um, and then was arrested right after the taping. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, no, the show is very controversial. So, yeah. the, the producers down, right down there in Burbank, he wouldn't uh, do an interview. But, but what, what's crazy is I went to lunch the day that uh, her body was found uh, with Beto. And Beto and his, were at this fancy restaurant. We keep getting interrupted by these people saying, Beto, oh, we love your show. We're so happy. And, uh, and he showed me his Blackberry, and he had an email from the producer. And his English, Beto's English is decent, but it's not great. And he'd written, uh, our first contestant has died. <laughs> Which is funny, because it could be like our first, like from our first show, or it could be like the first of many contestants has died. Oh, um, uh, and, and Howard Schultz, the the producer of the American producer of the show had written this very long email saying, oh, Beto, we can never know the people who come to us when we give them a platform in order to, to tell the truth, you know, this and that. Like a very sort of like pop psych uh, explanation of why it was, this was all morally okay and he shouldn't feel bad. So Beto, when is the show coming to America? Oh, it was already canceled. <laughs> Howie Mandel was the, was the it, it came and went like that, yeah. Uh, Jerry Springer, I think, was one of the hosts uh, but it came and went. Here it was called uh, Moment, Moment of, truth. of Truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Megan, you have oh, the mic. Yeah. Hi. This is it's really a powerful piece. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about your process of, I mean, talking to people who have been so media saturated and then going in and talking to them again. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously you have you have audio and, and text. So just what was your process of, you know, getting them uh, to talk to you one again after going through that media thing and then just also reporting on different platforms with such a sensitive topic? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to contact them before I went to Peru, but I, I felt like it wasn't, that it was best just to show up and have them be able to explain who I am and what I was doing, you know? I, I uh, have a big network, I'm from Peru, I'm, I'm Peruvian, um, so I have a, a fairly extensive network of, of friends and journalists down there, and, um, and there's a, a, a magazine called Caretas, and I know people at Caretas, and their sort of, produ their, their writer who had covered the story was a, a kid named Eduardo Garcia Peña, who, who uh, knew where the family lived. And so basically I got to Lima, I dropped off my bags, I picked him up, and we went and just knocked on the door, you know? And um, uh, Vilma is in terrible shape. I mean, she was when I was, she was terrible shape. Um, super depressed, she seems like she's aged, you know, 10 years. Um, from the photos that you see just recently. Um, but, uh, you know, I think they just wanted, th they were so surprised that someone had come back. You know, they were so surprised that anyone cared. Um, they were very, very open to it. Um, it was harder to talk to Brian's family. Brian's mother didn't want to go on tape. Um, 
And then finally to her, I said, look, you know, everyone that I've interviewed says your son is a monster. And if you don't talk to me, then no one, we're not going to hear anyone saying, you know, he liked to play soccer or he was nice to his sister or he loved his bunny or whatever, you know, and I don't, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I can't meet him. He's in jail. Um, so like someone has to, to talk to me, you know, and she eventually agreed, but she wouldn't, she wouldn't go on tape. So in the piece, I do try to tell a story. And Beto, you know, Beto, I think, um, you know, he was both easy and hard to talk to. Easy because, um, you know, when I told him that I wanted to come down to talk to him, he tweeted out, you know, uh, and essentially, you know, with like six exclamation points, like, Daniela Larcón's profiling me for the New Yorker, motherfuckers, like, to his like <laughs> two million followers or whatever. Um, a tweet that I think he subsequently deleted and he just blocked me. Um, so, uh, you know, I think I was very fair with Beto, and I think if, you, if, if Peruvians know exactly how controversial Beto is and all of his sordid past, uh, if they read the piece or if they hear the whole Radio Ambulante piece, they'll, you know, you will, I think, agree with me that I could have destroyed him. And I think I was very, very fair, stuck to the, the, the case at hand. Um, but, you know, he, he, he doesn't see it that way. Um, uh, he fired David Navoa for talking to me. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I mean, the, the hardest part and the most sensitive part is like, okay, these people have gone through so much, like, why put them through it again? Um, but they were, I think, very, wi very willing and eager to sort of get, get it out. I think we have time for one more. Maybe this individual has a question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more question, Annabelle. I'm sorry. Annabelle? Thank you. Which are the most important stories for Radio Ambulante? I mean, which kind of stories do you really choose to cover and why? Well, we, 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 we're we currently able to produce like a story a month, a new story a month, and then maybe little cortos in between and, and we're re releasing from archives. And we um, are ramping up production to two stories a month in the second half of the year. So we want to have a mix of stories that are uh, both like hard-hitting investigative pieces. We want to tackle, uh, you know, important news stories in Latin America that haven't had the space. Um, to, to be addressed, certainly not in audio, you know? We, we do feel that there's, obviously we work in sound, we feel that there's something inherently powerful about hearing the voices of the people who live the stories. So that, that to us is important. But we also don't wanna be, uh, you know, there's, there's many disturbing stories coming out of Latin America right now. Um, and we could do uh, a, a, a persistently grim podcast every month of, you know, human rights abuses, uh, you know, police abuse, arbitrary justice, drug war, you know, immigration catastrophes, tragedies, and this and that. We do try to keep it mixed. So if we just, we did this, this year, when our new season, we've done um, a piece on, on the Ayotzinapa uh, that was indirectly tied with the Ayotzinapa based on, on the, out of Mexico. We did a piece on, uh, on, uh, trans issues in Mexico with a protagonist telling us what it's like to change your gender in Mexico City with partner with the New York Times on that. Um, and we, uh, we did a piece with Radiolab about um, Cuban self-infected HIV patients, um, both in, in Spanish and English with Radiolab. Uh, we have a piece coming out. Then we released a, a kind of funny piece about two people who look alike, who have the same name and who get confused for each other even though they live in different countries. And, and it's not like a hard-hitting investigation, but it's a hilarious, utterly charming, great piece of radio, you know? So we try to mix the storytelling that is like, you know, pure sort of, I I'm a novelist, you know? So I do appreciate a well-told story, obviously. Um, and I, I, I feel like we have to give our audience something that's fun now and then. Uh, and our next piece is about a, a, a pretty hilarious Twitter fight between uh, Rafael Correa and a guy named Crudo Ecuador. Uh, which maybe you heard about, it was on John Oliver. Um, but we got a really great interview with, with the actual person behind Crudo, and it's, um, it's kind of about social media and about politics and about freedom of speech in the end. So we, we mix it up. Yeah. Thank you so much for your Thank questions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>